everyone, welcome to chapter five, method, methods and strategies of research. So this week we're gonna be talking all about uh, some representative and common neuroscience research. So for part one, we're gonna be discussing experimental ablation or brain lesions, the destruction of portions of brain tissue and then subsequent testing to infer basically what that region was doing. So an experimental ablation or a lesion is the removal or destruction of a portion of the brain of a laboratory animal, usually. Um, intentional lesions in, in humans are uh, rare. Functions that can no longer be performed must rely critically on that region. So that's the rationale that we're working with here. So if an animal can do something before a lesion and it can't do it afterwards, that is some evidence that that region is important for performing that function. Similarly, if a person has some sort of a traumatic brain injury or a, a stroke or a tumor, they lose function of a portion of their brain and they develop a deficit in some sort of a behavior, we might be able to infer that that brain region is important for that uh, particular function. But when it comes to destroying or inactivating brain regions and then inferring um, function, we do have to be somewhat careful, right? You might imagine that we put a rat into a maze and teach it to run through the maze and then we destroy a particular brain region and the rat takes a very long time to complete the maze, right? You might be tempted to con sort of conclude, oh, we must have destroyed some sort of a memory center. But it's also possible that you've caused some sort of a performance problem, right? Like if you've destroyed motor cortex, for example, on your way down, the rat might have a problem moving around, might have locomotor issues. So it's nothing to do with learning, but more their ability to perform the behavior. That's why careful controls are necessary. So let's talk through some different types of brain lesioning techniques. The first is aspiration. This is a lesion produced by removing tissue via suction. Uh, this isn't really used today. This is an earlier method of, of conducting this. Electrolytic lesions. This is pa produced by passing an electrical current through an electrode. So an, an the uninsulated tip of a metal wire, basically, that is dropped into some brain tissue. And a current is passed through and it destroys that brain tissue via heat. This destroys everything, right? It basically just burns a space out uh, around where the tip of that electrode is. So it destroys cell bodies as well as fibers of passage. The more modern approach is what we call an excitotoxic lesion. Lesion produced by the intracerebral infusion of an excitatory amino acid such as canic acid or NMDA. So these are ligands for specific types of excitatory receptors. So basically this can cause uh, um, overexcitation of the cell that leads to cell death. This destroys cell bodies, so it can only affect places where there are this sort of receptor, which are expressed primarily on cell body region dendrites. So this will destroy cell bodies, but it won't destroy fibers of passage. So if you have a white matter tract moving through that region that you don't want to destroy, an excitotoxic lesion will selectively destroy cell bodies while not destroying axons passing through, whereas electrolytic lesions will destroy everything, right? They just burn off all the tissue, right? That can be a problem because if you destroy a tract of axons passing through a region, you're going to disconnect two regions, possibly inadvertently. So... That's one advantage of the excitotoxic lesion method. I do want to mention here the sham lesion. This is basically just a placebo procedure. Um, it is all of the stuff that you would do in a typical lesion procedure, except for the damage-causing step. So for an electrolytic lesion control, you would lower an electrode in and remove it and then sort of patch things up. Uh, the only thing you're doing is not destroying the tissue. The reason you do this is it controls for any effects of anesthetic, and the stress called, caused by the procedure itself and the recovery time. So it's just meant to equate for the experience with everything except the destruction of that tissue. So let's briefly talk through an example of something we might observe with a lesion approach, some, some classical work that's been done. So um, there's a task called the Morris water maze where there is a platform that is just below the surface of some opaque water. Um, rats are placed into this um, tub and are uh, tasked with finding their way to this hidden the rats are released from multiple start points on different trials, so north, south, east, west arm or locations around the outside of the pool. And because of the nature of this task, the rats have to use their hippocampus to learn where in space this location is. They can't just learn to make a turn, they have to learn where this object is. So a test, we put the rats in the pool, and they move directly over to that platform and get out. Right? Rats are proficient but reluctant swimmers, they're not in any danger of, of drowning. They just would rather not be swimming. They'd rather be resting on this platform. So they're motivated to get out of the water and onto the platform. So if we have a rat with an intact hippocampus, uh, sort of pictured here with a nissel stain that we'll talk about later, they're able to be dropped into the pool and move directly over to their platform. And 
However, what if we perform a lesion of the hippocampus? We destroy this whole brain region that's so important for spatial learning and memory. This rat will then perform much like a naive rat, right? Its memory for the location of that platform has been lost. It's unable to perform the task. So we might conclude that the hippocampus seems to be necessary for the performance of this spatial navigation task. So again, the general approach for how we do this is a brain lesion is produced. Um, we observe the effects on the animal's behavior. We then uh, slice the brain, stain it, observe it under a microscope so we can verify the precise location and extent of the damage, right? We want to make sure the lesion was where we thought it was. In order to do that, we fix the brain, slice it, stain it, and examine it using histological methods. And I'll talk about all that stuff in more detail uh, later on. So another method we can use to ask questions about the function of a brain region is called a temporary inactivation. This is a drug-induced reversible lesion typically administered via cannula. So a cannula is an indwelling implant that can be installed. It's basically just a metal tube that can be implanted on top of the animal's head. So this portion of the tube right here would be actually inside the skull and projecting to a specific brain region. This portion out here would be exposed outside of the skull with a little cap on it. Um, when we want to do our manipulation, we just basically attach a injector here, this internal cannula, that goes inside of this guide cannula that's been implanted, which is attached to a pump delivery system, which can then infuse a quantity of drugs. There are a number of drugs that will produce a sort of broad inactivation, right? An anesthetic such as lidocaine, which will block voltage-gated sodium channels and prevent action potentials. So this will prevent neurons from firing in the region. Uh, likewise, musomol or baclofen, these are drugs that are GABA receptor agonists. So they will sort of activate GABA receptors and dampen down the activity of that region, prevent those neurons from firing by hyperpolarizing them. Once the drug wears off and is cleared by metabolism, the uh, regions will sort of return to normal function. So it's a temporary lesion or reversible inactivation, meaning that um, the effect of the inhibition of that region is transient and the animal will return to a normal state after the drug clears. This method is also used to deliver other types of drugs, right? So drugs that are specific agonists or antagonists for certain receptor types, right? You might have a dopamine receptor antagonist, for example, that you would like to infuse if you're curious about um, what the contribution of a specific signaling pathway is to a given region. Okay, so how do we accomplish brain surgery in the lab? It's honestly not as complex as you might think. Uh, here are a couple of the tools that we need, right? We have a stereotaxic atlas. This is a collection of drawings, images of brain sections with measurements that provide coordinates for basic stereotaxic surgery, right? So we have basically maps of the brain with very, very precise measurements that show us exactly where um, brain regions we might want to target are. And most likely at this point, if you are studying a brain region that is at all studied, you aren't the first person to do so. So you can consult the literature and see what coordinates other people have used, uh, pilot out those coordinates in your own lab and see what... Stereotaxic surgery uses this stereotaxic apparatus. Um, this allows us to position um, cannula or electrode or whatever it is you're implanting within the desired brain region. So this is basically just a fancy three-dimensional ruler, right? You can secure the animal's head right here in the apparatus, and then we have sort of arms that can move in three dimensions. Uh, the fancier ones have automatic um, measuring tools, so you can set a zero point and then move the arms relative to that point, and then we'll measure it out automatically. But basically, the, the point of the stereotaxic apparatus is to um, secure the, the animal's head in a set position from which you can use these extremely precise measurement tools to find um, the coordinates that you looked up in your stereotaxic atlas. So here's an example of a, sort of a, a drawn page from a stereotaxic atlas. So if this is our target right here, here, so our example is the uh, fornix in this uh, diagram, we could then use the measurement tools that are afforded to us to determine exactly where this is, and we could use those coordinates to target this region. So to do this, we use suture lines, or where sort of the plates of the skull are fused together as our guide. After the um, skin has been cut and retracted, we can see the sutures of bone. We then use some very reliable landmarks as our starting point. So bregma is this right here, this little T-shaped juncture. This is the junction of the sagittal and coronal sutures of the skull. Back here is lambda, um, which is another reference point that we use. Bregma is the most common 
reference point for stereotactic surgery. You basically set your zero point to this and then move relative to that. So let's find the coordinates that we need. So let's say we want to target this region right here, the nucleus accumbens. Um, let's do some directional terms we have uh, talked about previously. So first off, let's find our anterior posterior coordinate. The extent of how far uh, back or front the region is that we're looking for. So we're looking right here for the middle of the nucleus accumbens uh, core region. So we need a bregma of 1.7 millimeters, so 1.7 millimeters in front of that bregma point. So if we follow this line up, we can find our medial lateral coordinate. So how close to the midline is this is the um, target that we're looking for? So we get a medial lateral coordinate of uh, 1.8 millimeters. So we can measure that as right here. And then we have our dorsal ventral coordinate. So how far down is the structure of negative 6.8? So basically, now we have our directions. We have our map to this brain region. We just need to use our stereotactic apparatus and input those coordinates, and we are all set. So here's a little cartoon of what that setup might look like. We have the rat anesthetized and secured in the stereotactic apparatus, and we can use this three-dimensional arm with these adjustment knobs to uh, find our target. And here's an example of what a stereotactic apparatus might look like fitted for a human patient. So after we've done whatever it is that we've done, we need to determine that we hit the right spot, right? Um, brain surgery is a little complicated and it's possible to make mistakes, so we need to verify that we've got everything in the right place. To do that, we need to fix the tissue and then section it. So a fixative is a chemical such as Form 1 that preserves and prepares body tissue for the slicing process. This will first off halt autolytic or self-dissolving enzymes, which will prevent uh, decomposition by bacteria or other microorganisms, so we want to stop the brain from decomposing and degrading quickly. This also has the benefit of hardening soft tissue. So the brain is sort of gelatinous and not very solid. Uh, a fixative will fix the tissue and make it harder and easier to work with. After the tissue has been extracted, we can use something like a microtome or a cryostat. In fact, we have a cryostat that looks very similar to this uh, upstairs in the biopsych lab. Um, think of this as sort of like a, like a science deli slicer. Basically, it's got a very, very... Um, sharp blade inside and a mechanism that when you crank this handle over here is capable of advancing the stage, uh, the, the place where the sample is attached by a very, very small amount. So, um, you know, as little as uh, on the order of microns. So we can produce 40 micron slices with this. Uh, pretty uh, this is done under cold conditions, right, to keep things hard and intact. Uh, after we slice our tissue, we can collect it and then mount it onto slides so we can stain it and visualize whatever it is we're trying to visualize. Okay, that was, that's it for our discussion of um, lesion and inactivation. We're going to come back to this thread and, uh, later on and talk more about staining tissue and looking at things under a microscope. See you next.